Yes. So when you, if you have a question, please, um, uh, I think there's a couple of microphones around. And you're conveniently located right next to one, so. <clears throat> so, um, hi. I was curious as to why you have, why you are doing these mappings only for the neurons. It's like, you know, sequencing the protein and then focusing only on two, uh, one third of the amino acids. Um, the astrocytes are regulating the actions of the neurons just as critically. They are far greater in number. So when, while you are doing these multi-million dollar projects, just do it all. Uh, yeah, which we could do it all, but we can't. You know, we, we live in a finite world with finite resources. So in the human brain, we know there are 86 billion uh, neurons, and they're roughly comparable 100 billion non-neuronal uh, cells in the human brain. On the other hand, we, we care. So we, we, right now, we are focusing on rapid perception, what happens in the first couple of seconds. And we know that uh, given the time scale of perception and fast motor control, that to first extent, um, you're looking for great specificity, and the great specificity we find in neurons we don't find at that time scale in astrocytes. So while there's no question astrocytes and oligocytes and all the other um, glia and, and uh, other non-neuronal cells are critical overall for homeostasis, I'm not sure they're really essentially involved in, uh, in rapid action perception. But you know, ultimately we'll have to study them too, but that's what we choose to focus on because of the, the time scale that we're looking at. Christoph, um, I was just wondering if you could comment on the reproducibility from mouse to mouse with respect to the number of cells, the different cell types, and the uh, the interactome of the of the of the cells. So um, we just did a project to exactly address that and find there is even if we just stay with the same strain, p56 male mice. Uh, in fact, Susan here. Um, um, led that project, we, we, we still find um, in considerable variability, um, you know, in the 10s and 20s percent. Now, somebody else, Marcel Oberländer, found for somatosensory, there's the variability, if you just look at in somatosensory in the, in the whisker, the, the barrel fields, there the variability may be as low as 5 to 7 percent. As our tools get better, as, for example, registration, like Han Chuan talked about, get, get better and better, the, the, um, it turns out there's more precise regulation than we think. But it's unclear whether it'll ever get down to the level of regulation you have in Drosophila, let alone in C. elegans. Is this cell types or genes? Uh, no, these are neurons. Just neurons. Just neurons. So the question is, is the variability, is the same variability if we look at, begin to look at specific cell types right now, we, we, and we don't know. But we don't know there's a huge amount of biological noise even at the transcriptomic, at the single cell level. So you expect that to be amplified also in the level of, uh, of the number of neurons. Yeah, exactly. In, in, in terms of density or the total number of neurons in the, for example, in the LGN or in, in primary visual cortex. But then it depends exactly how accurate can we model primary <laughs> visual cortex. And you measure the number of processes, sir? Uh, axons. So that's what we're right now we're trying to do with EEM to really get to to oh, really yeah. get yeah. that number precisely. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is for Christoph. So both Lee and Christoph mentioned about. Uh, using these maps to study consciousness and stuff. So I was wondering, how do you define consciousness, and how do you differentiate between a thing that's alive and conscious? Uh, I think you passingly mentioned when you talked about mouse that it's obviously conscious, but how do you differentiate a conscious state? How do you define it in terms of modeling or studying using systems biology? <clears throat> Is it like a phenotype, or how do you define it? No, it's uh, it's um, it's uh, the the feeling of the feeling of anything, the feeling of seeing red or being angry or you know, any other having particular pain. So philosophers call it, it's about something. You're in a particular state, and the state feels like something. In fact, the, the, the only way you know about anything in the world is because you have conscious, you have an experience of pain, of pleasure, of seeing a world meter, of reading. Even our science ultimately depends on you having a particular experience. Now, we know through 150 years of cognitive psychology, there are masses of things you and your body can do without being conscious. In fact, most of the organs in your body, including the liver, most of the brain does lots of things without you having any insight. My immune system right now might be active, 
but, but I'm not conscious of it. Yet there seems to be a substate of brain states that are closely associated with consciousness. And the question is, what is it about those brain states that give rise to this conscious sensation? And, and there's no doubt in my mind that you see it in, in all mammals and possibly in most, if not all, multicellular organisms. Yes, Christoph. Oh, sorry. No, that's it. Go ahead. I remember... Um, And We've solved the problem always, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> and you discussed, uh, I remember I was really struck because you talked about people that have a blind spot in the eye. And if you would urge them to, if you showed a light in the blind spot and you would say, where is the spot? They would say, I can't see it. And you would urge them and urge, urge them to say where it is. And then if they guessed, they guessed right. And that was along the lines of what you're saying, that there are these subconscious brain states that know, even though consciously you don't know. And now you mention the immune system, and I'm wondering, to what extent do you think? So clearly, the brain knows what's happening, may know what's happening in the brain that, they're, that we're not aware of subconsciously. But what about other states of the body, like you mentioned the immune system? Uh, do you think it's true that the brain could be aware of certain things happening? And in the rest of the body, physiologically, and indeed have control over some of those things without our being conscious of it. And this might have something to do with, for example, the placebo effect, where someone believes that they're going to get better because they take a sugar pill, and somehow that influences the body. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the body, the, the brain ultimately knows about most of the, the other organs of the body, has access to it. But, but the surprising thing is, given that immune system is a very complex system and has memory, right? I mean, you know, once I'm exposed to, I build an antibody, but I don't have, as a, as a conscious entity, I don't have access to that. So the, this gives rise to the interesting question, why not? What, where, where is the difference? Why do I have access to certain things? I do have access to the state of my visual system, for instance, but I don't have access to the state of my immune system or the state of, 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 my, of my enteric nervous system, by and large. And people think the most popular theory relates it, I'm sorry to say, to complexity. There are specific <laughs> theory that, that, that has a specific measure of complexity that, that says consciousness really relates very, at a very deep level, fundamental level, to the complexity of a, of a system suitable to define using a mathematical calculus. Maybe we could call it diversity. <laughs> okay, that, that. Uh, uh, completely different. So the data set that's being generated where AAV is being injected, uh, I guess a ubiquitous promoter driving GFP, and then uh, tracing where it goes. Um, I've looked at some of that data, and some of it's gorgeous, but some of it's very complex. And I'm wondering if specific promoters were used instead to drive the GFP if that data set might be, prove a little bit more useful. Yeah, so that's currently what we're doing. So the first data set that's out there is all just in, in wild type. So we're now using specific promoter in all sorts uh, that we got from the community that we've generated ourselves. And so, yeah, that data is going to be easier to interpret because now you're just talking about a subtype of layer 5 cells and its projection down to colliculus. Yeah, and, and so we're trying to do that in many thousands of, um, um, of brain regions with uh, causing it with, um, with 100 different Cree lines. So it's going to be much more useful. Also for defining a um, hierarchical relationship like people have them in a monkey. Yeah, go ahead. I don't understand the relationship of the, that mapping technique with the Cree lines. You're not using Cree in that first data set. It's just a promoter driving GFP. Yeah, just to do to do a fir, to do you know a first uh, coarse grained modeling, uh, uh, a coarse grained connectomic map. So you know you inject, let's say, into the deep. You 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 try to to, to limit it, let's say, to the deep layer of visual cortex. But now most of the cells, or 30 percent of 35 percent of the cells, that get infected, and you see all projections that leave that particular area, as compared to only looking at the projection of deep layer six cells uh, in primary visual cortex. So the latter, of course, is much more specific. But that would just be specific promoter driving GFP and therefore only labeling uh, cells for its expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not cr yeah. In the back? Oh, I think this gentleman was ahead of me. Uh, okay. Um, my question is, I understand why you're applying complex, diverse 
biological systems to health issues and medicine. But have any of you considered the implications of this for education? We live in an era where everyone, every child who attends school is expected to meet common core standards. Teachers are not given training in the brain or genetics. And the facts are, and my team from the University of Washington along with others have decades of data about this, they are diverse because of the brain and genes. What might you, who are doing wonderful work in this institute, do to also help people understand the educational implications, applications of biological systems? So, you know, if you look at the developmental response I showed you, that between the age of three or four and 10, there are twice many, connection, uh, twice many uh, connections and the rate twice as high. <clears throat> um, that's neuronal plasticity. To mothers, that's the developmental period that shapes the behavior of our children. But whatever the children learn during that period is going to connect up the brain for a lifetime. So that is a critical period from four to 10. But now, how do we- some, some left later, but it's decreased. But that's when you teach. And kids, in the beginning, have great imagination. They can do many things. Then society says, no, you can only do these things and these things. Just to clarify my question, I, because um, I teach about the brain to a variety of people in psychology and education and other <clears throat> fields. But we're not getting it out to policymakers that are having impact on the experiences or the understanding. How, how can we get science to the policy makers that are affecting our current and future generations of learners? Well, it's our job as, as new as brain scientists. Now that brain science is coming of age and is consuming big public resources, it's also all, uh, our job to talk to them, to write books, to go out on TV, to, uh, to point people out, you know, the, the, the developing brain. So it's, it's, we can't just point at other people. We all have to do it and participate in educating the general but, public, A, and specifically teachers and B, politicians, what this means for traumatic brain injury, for the developing brain, etc. Just uh, You know, all, yeah. of, all of Lee's life, he's taught little kids. And, and there are actually students who sequence a lot of the genome. But, you know, you have to get out and do it. And uh, you know, I've gotten involved with a lot of educational programs and kids have been learning systems for kids and so forth. The biggest problem we run into often is called the teachers' unions. I think that's changing. <coughs> I hope so. Well, I'll tell you, that in the Catholic Church. I hope so. They, they are actually, <laughs> a actually <laughs> um, they're, they're forming national standards for teachers to professionalize and they're going to have something like the bar exam and the medical exams and I don't know if you know what happened here in Seattle teachers voice teachers and need to stand we're up. at a time of change and you can be part of it no. so I'd like to ask Phelps uh, about what fraction of the Alzheimer's uh, people show this big uh, glucose Decline. I mean, is it is it pretty much all of them, or have you done a good number? Well, not the, <clears throat> so the accuracy in identify. You know, Alzheimer's is an awkward situation clinically. Sure. Yeah. So a patient comes in with a family member. The family member and the patient are aware of progressive short-term memory declines and some cognitive decline. They do all these tests, rule out hypothyroid, hyperthyroidism, and do all these tests. They're all normal. Then they say, but there's a clinical question of, of dementia, and there are many possibilities in that. Come back in a year. Well, pay $14,000 and come back in a year. And, and you go through these repetitions over and over with all these normal tests. And then some of the tests start to change. But the single thing they're looking for is progressive degenerative dementia and not benign forms. Are you changing? So, very accurately, with 93% accuracy in the very beginning, one test, 
you have Alzheimer's. Very different pattern in frontal temporal dementia who have very different responses to cholinesterase inhibitors, multiple infarct dementia, Huntington's subcortical dementia. You can separate all of them. So how early can you go in terms of cognitive decline? Do well, we showed that we had gone, gone back to five to eight years and, and very accurately seen the change. Now, when we go back that far, we do, we do bring in that, bring in to that APOE4. So we do add another measure into that for that accuracy. What, what did you bring in? I missed that. What do you bring in also? A, a, APOE4. APOE status, yeah. the genetic characterization yeah. of the APOE status. Yeah. It's not predictive. But yeah. it is associated and helpful. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. one last question. Uh, so my question is for Dr. Feng um, about your uh, VAA3D okay. software. Um, so in terms of the, both the spatiotemporal resolution and the automation of it, I was wondering whether um, the, uh, the autom automatic tracing is able to detect the width of the spines. Um, and also whether, like, how accurate is the automation in terms of, um, so I had to do a lot of uh, manual tracing uh, <laughs> during my grad studies, and I was wondering, um, like, we had, there were commercially available uh, neural tracing softwares out there, like Neuralucida, uh, I think Flowview might have something, um, but at the end of the day, um, it just wasn't accurate enough, so even if, uh, if, even if I did aut automatic tracing, I'd have to go back and manually fix it, so. <clears throat> yeah, we, uh, our software actually um, have several different, you know, working mode. It's let you be able to do things, okay, um, in a completely automatic way or in a semi-automatic way. Okay, um, if you want to, if you really care about the, um, the final result and you want to do the proofreading, you can actually use our software to do that relatively easily, okay. Um, I don't want to actually make a comparison to the commercial software because actually a lot of things, um, times, okay, they could actually make it uh, robust enough to be able to be commercial is because actually they use a simple, you know, simpler, you know, technology, okay, actually that means, okay, you will have a lot of more manual thing, okay. On the other hand, okay, uh, our tool has been developed, you know, kind of like, you know, um, more on this research side, okay, so we need to deal with a lot of data, so we have to, you know, to make the software to be able to um, uh, as automatic as possible. At the same time, we want to actually also estimate, you know, how precise so the error bound, you know, all these things, okay, what type of, what, what are the different type of the errors, okay, for the 3D reconstruction and so on. So um, you're welcome to use our software and um, we, we will actually um, have more and more modules become available, okay, because, you know, it's associated with uh, um, a lot of different collaboration with different groups, okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much the current and, case. Uh, um, but we are going to actually do the, um, probably next week, uh, we are going to do uh, like a web webinar, okay, on how to use a 3D tracing software, okay, um, and we are going to actually demo the software as a neuro neuromorph dot org conference actually uh, later next month so uh, right now it's April right so um, uh, June first okay so yeah so there will be a lot of activities and uh, I, I believe there will be a lot of media you know you know showing how to actually use the software and something like that okay you will come to check okay, okay. and so in terms of the spine width measurements and also uh, the like 4D uh, measurements so uh, th there's the 3D volume and if right. you want to look at the same neuron over time. Uh, is, is yeah, that's also possible. Company? Yeah, that's also possible. That's so the question is that okay, how about you know, for example, for the uh, new, uh, for the gr growing um, growing uh, neuron, right? So at different you image the three D neuron morphology at different time point, try to see you know where the axon goes, so something like that. Okay, once uh, the change of the different you know uh, degenerative arbor or something like that. Okay, so um, that has been uh, uh, challenging in the field. Okay, for 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 quite some years. Okay, there are some group actually contact me. Um, try to do that. Okay, we can actually with the software right now. You are able to actually very quickly um, uh, generate the morphology of the uh, any individual time point, and then you can actually compare them. Okay, uh, the problem actually became a little bit more complicated than simply um, just to come uh, say okay, you have the 4D data. Sometimes okay, the um, the data. Um, the image data could be generated, you know, slightly um, uh, uh, in dif in slightly different, you know, um, coordinate system. Okay, so um, after the neuron has 
you know, grow to some extent, so that you may actually also need to actually compare the the reconstructed structure, okay, in a, in a um, more sophisticated way. Okay, so the software has some ability to actually um, compare such of the reconstructions, not just the image data, but also the reconstruction in pretty much similar to the BLAST tool. Okay, we call it the BLAST neuron. Actually, we, we, we have some tool there called the BLAST neuron. Okay, so that we can actually find out what are the consistent portion of the neurons, okay, you know, across different, you know, reconstructions. Okay, so that can also be very useful for your particular problem, okay, as well as many other problems. Okay, okay. let's thank the speakers.